Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, September 27th, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. One of the neat uh, tricks which makes Python such a useful and popular language is the fact that, well, there are modules for everything. Your code is often just a couple lines uh, connecting uh, these modules. Xavier today looked at a malware sample written in Python that took advantage of the sandboxed module, which provides a simple function. Is sandboxed, as with the name implies, the function returns true if the code runs in a sandbox, false if it's not running in the sandbox. Now, the way this module works is it has a pretty good list of files that are often present in particular sandbox technologies. And then it also checks for about a dozen different process names and sees if they are running, which also is indicative of the code running in a sandbox. So pretty easy to extend this also for new sandboxes or as uh, manufacturers, for example, may change the names of some of these uh, files. Very focused on Windows at this point, but uh, certainly useful for an attacker who wants to prevent their code from running in a sandbox in order to it for it to be analyzed. Now, of course, there's also uh, the idea of sort of vaccination or inoculation, it's sometimes called, where you create one of these files in order to trick the malware into believing that it's running in a sandbox and that way it uh, won't run. Well, um, be a little bit careful with this. I've also seen uh, malware that just becomes destructive if it runs in a sandbox. So it's not always where it just exits. And talking about evading sandboxes, uh, one trick, of course, is to sort of ask for user interaction uh, with your sample. And uh, we do have an interesting uh, piece of malware written up by a security company Cluster25. And uh, they attributed it to a Russian APT group, so the usual fancy bear. And it uses a mouse over trick in PowerPoint to launch uh, the malware. This technique uh, works without having to rely on macros, which of course also helps with evading uh, detection as typical for more advanced threats. Uh, one of the hallmarks is not necessarily a fancy exploit, but uh, very much so the very targeted phishing lore that's being used here. The sample that uh, they're using here is a sample that or an email that or PowerPoint that claims to come from the Organization of Economic Corporation and Development or OECD. And uh, then when the PowerPoint is opened, it uh, includes hyperlinks. If you watch the slideshow and hover the mouse over one of these hyperlinks, then you're actually triggering a PowerShell script. This is a known feature in PowerPoint and has been documented as far back as 2017. So not necessarily a new trick, but not really seen that much. And, uh, well, once the user hovers over that link, then a second stage is uh, being loaded and executed. Uh, the second stage is actually delivered sort of inside an image. So it has an image header with the malware attached. We often see that to evade uh, some uh, detection. And the image also comes from a Microsoft OneDrive account. Again, makes it more difficult to detect if it's coming from a legitimate and frequently used cloud service like this. In the end, uh, the victim ends up with a copy of the graphite malware that's often associated with this uh, threat actor. And uh, the command and control uh, communication uses Microsoft OneDrive. Redis published a critical patch fixing a remote code execution flaw related to the X autoclaim command in Redis. The flaw is a heap-based buffer overflow, so arbitrary code execution, and it is uh, triggered by passing a crafted count argument to the X autoclaim function. Version 7.0.0 and newer are affected. I never wanted uh, your team to win a sports event, but, well, um, 
your athletic ability just wasn't quite there and up to the task. Well, uh, Maxwell Dullen has sort of a series of blog posts where he uh, takes apart uh, one of those scoreboards and the wireless controller that comes with it in order to see if the signals can be spoofed. He surprised me too, and he mentioned himself uh, being surprised by uh, the wireless communication actually using AES encryption, which isn't really that bad. But the second part of the blog post shows how to retrieve the key, and the key appears to be very straightforward and simple and probably uh, the same static key across all of uh, these uh, devices. Neat post if you're interested in some hardware hacking and sort of how to uh, dive into some devices like this. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.